The next segment is the segment on trauma laboratory testing, uh, to look at sort of myths and mysteries about it, and we will do so. Um, again, with the framework of ATLS, ATLS in the seventh edition, which just came out last year, mitigated their stance just a little bit. And what they said this year was they said, of course we didn't need that mean that every patient needs every lab. That's what they had been saying for the first six iterations of trauma, which is that everyone needs two lines, everyone needs to be x-rayed head to toe, everyone needs fingers and toes in every orifice, and everyone needs a full battery of labs. And in their companion manual, which is the opt uh, uh, resources for the optimal care of the injured patient, they further confirm that. This year, they finally said, of course there's room for judgment and you don't need to do it. There's one sentence in bold to mitigate the rest of the book, which says, get every test imaginable. And so the first one to come under our scrutiny here will be the ABG. Now, in our center, which is a level one trauma center, which has a lot of trauma research and we have a trauma registry, there's nothing that excites the trauma critical care people more than the term base deficit. Boy, are they excited about it. They think it has all kinds of importance and they really want ABGs. If there's not an ABG being done, they will send an intern down to get it very early in the course, even down in the emergency room. They feel like they just gotta have an ABG. Now the literature is kind of mixed on the topic. You will see papers like number one there, which is from the University of Rochester in New York, that pointed out that the clinical exam was not that reliable and that the reason you needed the ABG was to detect the surprise patient, one in five they said, with a metabolic acidosis that was out of what would have been expected based on their history and physical and that then you would know which patients need to go to the ICU. So you gotta follow that. Metabolic acidosis, unsuspected, therefore ICU. Now the problem with this, that concept, is that it's out of touch with the rest of the literature across medicine in DKA and sepsis and others that say that the acidosis per se is not really a problem. In fact, now the mode of ventilation of choice in most critical care units for medical illness is permissive hypercapnia. Damn the pH, let it fall. Let the pH go to 7-1. The pH in itself is not a disease. It's the things that cause it. And if you're causing it by permissive hypercapnia, it's no big deal. And so one is a supportive paper that says you should get it. Abstract two says, yeah, all right, I'll give it to you every once in a while on patients who need it selectively, but can we stop doing it every morning in the ICU as part of standing orders? This is one of the attacks that's been out there. And there's a lot of literature in this regard that says that routine labs for pre-op or as a standing order in the ICU, which is I'm gonna get an ABG CBC Chem 7 in the morning, just doesn't pan out. And so here's a paper that says that they decrease their actual um, uh, cost from $4,100 to patient to $3,300 per patient by just putting in some selectivity with regards to AM labs in a critical care unit. And then abstract three asks the next question, which is, all right, so you want this pH and this base deficit information. If I just say I'm not going to argue with you on that, then the next question is you still don't need an ABG, just get a VBG. It will give you almost all the same information and the correlation between ABG and VBG is exquisitely good. You get R values for correlation that range anywhere between 0.93 and 0.98 and so some people say well you're, you're just splitting hairs now, VBG, ABG, who cares? If I ask for an ABG and you say get a VBG, does this really matter? Who does it matter to? The patients. When you ask patients repeatedly, the thing, if, and there are a bunch of studies on this, that say, they say, what's the most obnoxious thing we do to them on a regular basis? And there are three things that come up that they don't really like. The first is they don't like the ABG because it fucking hurts. And someone's fishing around in their wrist and they got to do the Allen's test and it hurts. They don't like it. And the second thing they don't like is the NG tube. They really don't like the NG tube. And everyone in the room knows this because you've all had a patient say, not the left nair, not the right nair, not either nair, shaking it off like it's, you know, some evil snake. And the last thing, of course, is the Foley catheter, which is used to determine what the true Glasgow coma score is on a drunk because they appear to be 111 until you put the Foley in, at which point they go like this. This is the classic. And that's, so I, I would like to add points for the, for the Foley placement on the GCS, um, although I've been resisted on this um, by the people in Glasgow of all, who would resist there? But anyway, so the point of abstract three is, is that the VBG and the ABG have very high correlation. And if you wanted this data, we could save the patients from pain just by switching over to the VBG, which would avoid the harder question, which is, 
ABG, VBG, or NoBG. The NoBG means that is the clash of cultures, convincing our trauma colleagues that the blood gas doesn't offer much. That's a much harder thing to win. But the VBG versus ABG, I think, is winnable at a local level, and you can say, okay, we'll get, you, we'll get to that. The next trauma lab test, tox screens. Now, there are a bunch of reasons you could suppose to get a tox screen. And the first one is that everyone always wants to talk about is their surveillance role. We need to do tox screens on our, on our trauma patients so that we have some surveillance data on how important toxicology is on trauma and which drugs are involved. And sometimes that is true. So we learned, for example, through surveillance data that methamphetamine is way worse a drug than rock cocaine. With rock cocaine, and when you die, two-thirds of the time you die of a medical cause and one-third of the time you die of a, tr of a trauma cause. With with methamphetamine, two-thirds of the time you die of a trauma cause, and one-third of the time you die of a medical cause. So it's a much more dangerous drug in terms of trauma. We knew that alcohol is, is you know, it's half of all traffic fatalities. It's two-thirds of all uh, drownings. It's three-quarters of all fire deaths. It's three-quarters of all murders, if you include both the murderer and the murderee. If either of them are drunk, it's like, it's like three quarters. And so you go through the list, and for every death due to alcohol in the emergency department, there's 1,300 visits. But we don't need to keep doing surveillance on this. I mean, it's a pretty well-established fact. So the surveillance argument's weak. Now, how about the forensic argument? We need to get these things because they're going to use them to change people's outcomes in the law system. Well, that argument just is completely bankrupt because the chain of custody rules are not met, and any lawyer worse than assault will get you out of that if that's the only lab they have, except in one or two states which have by statute said we will accept the laboratory values from the hospital in court. If they have a statute that said that, you can do it, but otherwise, for basically 47 states, the forensic value of any labs you draw is zero for prosecution or otherwise, or defense. How about a diagnosis and treatment role? Over and over again, they've looked at the lab tests, and since toxidromes determine how you treat people, not their lab numbers, it turns out that, in, and particularly with regards to trauma patients where alcohol is by far and away the biggest drug that we're talking about, that's really not very important from that. And it's hard to show changes in management. In a huge series where they looked at the tox screens, did it change the management? The answer is no. And then finally, there's this issue with the quality of the tox screens. How good are bedside tox screens, whether you're looking at urines or lab tox screens in general? And the answer is, when you, whenever you get a tox screen, you should think, with the exception of alcohol, which is very easy to test for, with the exception of alcohol, you should be thinking that the tox screen is about 25% false positive and about 25% false negative. That's a pretty crappy test. My favorite study on tox screens was they took the biggest reference laboratories in the country, there were five or six of them around the country, with reference tox labs where they, they have their basic testing with thin layer chromatography and they have GC mass spec, they can do the whole thing. And they told them, they said, we're sending you 20 unknowns. And they went, oh, goody, 20 unknowns. And so they sent them the 20 unknowns and all six of the labs went 20 for 20. They went, whoo. What the labs didn't know was there was a second part of the test, which is in the next six months, we're sending you 20 more unknowns. We're just not telling you when. On those, they went 50%. These are the best labs in the country, not your hospital lab. And so you should be highly suspicious of the quality of these. Now, abstract four looks about alcohol and starts talking about this thing. And th there's all these papers that say that alcohol is, is kind of important to know that some, some papers say that your injuries are worse. Some people say that your injuries are better. And indeed, if you took all of the papers like four and like number seven, what you would find with alcohol is a classic bathtub curve. There's two hives of it that are, low, that, are, that are up here, and then it comes down in the middle, which is this, that indeed, you've all heard the saying, drunks and babies, they just never get hurt. They're relaxed. You know? And it's true that sometimes when drunks and babies fall, they don't get hurt because they bounce in a very relaxed fashion, and they don't get much wrong with them, and the mechanism wasn't that bad, and they're lucky. They're, they're at the low end of the outcome. But it's also true that when you're drunk, you tend to go off the road, and you tend to go off the road really fast, and you tend to go off cliffs and hit poles, and those people are hurt really badly. So you see both ends of it, that alcohol increases injury severity in one group, decreases injury severity in the other group, and overall it tends to be about a wash.
And so these papers that suggest I need to know the alcohol because it tells me something about the patient, I think it's very clear that there are both, out, both sides of that arm to be looked at. And so just being drunk doesn't tell me one thing or, or anything about the patient. Abstract 8, you want to read a fascinating paper on the topic of consent? This is a fascinating paper. This paper says that if you're going to get a tox screen on a patient, a trauma patient, for example, that you need to ask their consent. Why do you need to ask their consent? Because there's no patient expectation of benefit from this. Anyone who's looked at the tox literature knows that drawing a tox screen, the chances of this benefiting the patient in terms of treatment and management are almost zilch. Now, you could say we're going to refer them to rehab afterwards. That's why I need to know. And that's a do-gooder argument that's very hard to counter. The fact of the matter is if you look at discharge instructions for people who have, been, who have had alcohol and other drug-related crashes, very few of them get that rehab. But you could say we could do better, and that's why we need the tox screens to determine this. But this paper says you need consent because there's not much benefit, it's not really a medically indicated test, and that aut autonomy, confidentiality, and breach of duty are often evident in tox screening, and that furthermore, the tox screens frequently create a pejorative element of care that the staff is like, wow, that drunk bastard deserved it. Whatever he got, you know, I, you know he's got a couple femur fractures. We, hold the pain meds, he's drunk. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, is out there, and so this paper says, you want to get a tox screen? Why don't you ask them for consent, because there's not much benefit for it. It's an interesting legal argument. I don't know of any place where this is required, but it kind of fits into the consent discussion we were having earlier. Abstract 9 and 10 are fascinating. They're two of five papers in the, EM, in the Emergency Medical Abstracts database that say that when drunk people crash their cars, from a legal standpoint, the very best thing that could happen to them is to go to the emergency room, and furthermore, to be admitted. Why so? Because the cops may come in with them, and once the cops realize they're going to be admitted and the person has no insurance, in many states, who's paying for their admission if they arrive in custody? The cops are. So getting admitted, this provides a powerful disincentive for the legal system to cut you free at that point, and then they'll kind of like stalk you outside waiting for you to be discharged so that they could rearrest you. But it turns out that this reality, this financial reality, that if you're in an accident, arrive in custody and leave in custody means you're fully insured by the, the penal system, means that that's very much a problem. And so the cops often don't play, that once it's clear you're going to be admitted, they get uninvolved. And it turns out that going to the emergency room decreases your prosecution rate more than the most expensive lawyers in the country. Now. You don't need to know this for your patients, but just for all of you in the room, I tell you that if you do get stopped and it's a DUI, please crutch your chest, drop to the ground, shake and bake, do what you got to do, because it is much, much cheaper to get admitted to the hospital than to hire the legal teams. Now, as a program director for some, whatever it was, 10 years and been in a residency office for 14 years, I've had to deal with this with residents many times. And what happens when a resident gets busted for DUI, this is a career-threatening event. Your job is to get it decreased from a felony to a misdemeanor. In California, that misdemeanor is called a wet and reckless. And it will cost you about $20,000 to get a DUI converted to a wet and reckless. I know some of you are thinking, what's a wet and reckless? It sounds like girls gone wild. Um, it's nothing to do with that. That's just the legal term for the non-felony conviction. And that will cost you about twenty grand. Being admitted to the hospital for one day will cost you about four grand. The lawyers, the best lawyers in the country, have a lower success rate at getting it converted than going to the hospital. And so there's a bunch of papers on that. That also kind of deals with some of the forensic realities of tox screen testing in trauma patients. Um, now, abstracts 11 and on deal with this issue of the chemistry panel, and you could do eye stats and bedside. And I think it's pretty obvious to most of us that when a 20-year-old crashes his Kawasaki, it's probably not hyponatremia that caused the wreck. Um, and so, you know, looking at a Chem 7 on healthy people, it's, it's a really going to be low yield. And the most common thing found is going to be what when you're adrenergic? A little hypokalemia. Very commonly encountered in that setting. And so there's a bunch of papers on here. Abstract 11 says that routine testing does not appear to be warranted, that you could do something else instead of routine testing. Brace yourself, it's very unpleasant. You could do an H and P. And if the person said that they had those problems, like a kidney problem or something like that, then you could justify getting a Chem 7. And even doing that, 
would, would dramatically decrease trauma testing. Abstract 12 says that in peds, you can imagine how much yield it is in peds, right? The kids are a healthy young kid, very low yield. They said that the testing that you should do in pediatric trauma consists of a UA, a hematocrit, an AccuCheck, and a ProTime. Call it quits, you'd be done. And that that would catch most everything. Abstract 13 also says that it's really unimportant. They said that um, uh, there were some things that they missed, but they would found them all if they just routinely dipped urine. If they added a urine dip, they would have got there. Abstract 14 says that low K you find all the time when you're doing this, you find these Ks of 3 or 2.9, that it's irrelevant, that it's a benign and transient phenomena associated with the stress uh, that are with trauma. It may also re represent some of the dilutional effect of the normal saline that's being dumped into them, and that it's really not important. And so it's kind of interesting. By the way, when you look at this literature, you gotta do, you got to do one thing. Because they always say, we did X number of tests and we found these number of abnormalities. So they go, see, the test was important. But then you got to ask, but what did they do about the abnormality? And just because they did something about the abnormality, you then got to ask, did what they do about the abnormality matter? So among this literature, the most common abnormality identified on the chemistry panels that's treated is hypokalemia. And the treatment usually is the addition of 40 of KCL to the next liter that went up at 250 an hour, if it's an adult, for example. Now, with, with the paper I just reviewed for you, yes, they identified an abnormality, and yes, they treated it, but it still probably wasn't clinically important. And had it been unidentified and untreated, it wouldn't have resulted in a bad thing. So that doesn't really meet the, the minimum criteria for a test that's important to me. I don't think it probably does to most of you either. And so it's very hard to justify these things. Um, if you do, if you do a, 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 most of you have a basic metabolic panel, right, the seven things, and then you have a comprehensive metabolic panel that has somewhere between 13 and 18 things on it, depending on whether you get calciums, magnesiums, and things like that. If you do an 18 panel chemistry test on a normal population, what are the chances that one test will be abnormal? Yeah, it's like 90%. So the, more, the bigger your panel, the more abnormalities you're going to find. It doesn't mean they're important. It doesn't mean that they need to be treated. And so you have to recognize that the presence of abnormalities, this literature keeps, keeps saying we needed to do these tests because we found abnormal stuff that we didn't suspect would be there. No, the presence of abnormalities represents the bell curve. If you do enough tests, you will find an outlier. It doesn't mean that it's important. You've got to really look at these papers carefully to find out what, they, what they're saying about. Abstract uh, number 16 from the University of Miami says that the cost of, these, of this type of testing was $155,000 per year at their institution and that the charges were $777,000 per year. The point being here, and we've talked about this, and in the introduction to the chapter I wrote the usual story about the ever-closing of trauma centers, the fraying of the safety net, the falling apart of this, the lack of funding and resources, because while ATLS would tell you, what does ATLS tell you about the epidemiology of trauma? ATS tells you, ATLS would tell you that trauma, tearfully they would tell you this. They usually have the nurse coordinator for the course. Trauma is a disease that indiscriminately strikes down young, productive members of society in the prime of their years who need to be returned to their former level of function. That's, that's the story they tell you. We all know better, trauma is a disease of drunk, uninsured men, where the combined toxicology of testosterone and alcohol produces most of their problems, especially where assaults and car accidents are concerned. And so the problem is, is that trauma, if you want to be a trauma center, produces a disproportionate burden of uninsured care, which is very resource in intensive and very expensive which is why in Los Angeles we went from 25 trauma, level one trauma centers for 15 million people down to seven. Because federal monies were promised, but they just never came in a volume that was great enough to support the trauma center. And so the concept of maintaining a 24 hour a day in-house anesthesia and 24 hour in-house and available neurosurgeons and an OR team and all of the other resources that you need to have like interventional radiology. You can't be a trauma center now without having an interventional radiologist who's willing to be up at two in the morning. And let me tell you, if I gave you binoculars, telescopes, radioactive collars, you couldn't find one of those. If I gave you a week and a helicopter, 
radiologists who want to be up and actually touching patients at 2 in the morning, I think they're extinct. I mean, I don't know where they went. I can't find them. So the point here is, is that the money that's required to do this, if we're squandering it on useless lab tests, then our research stewardship is part of the blame for the closure of individual trauma centers. And so I think we can do better. The next issue that comes up with trauma testing is point of care testing. How many of you have point of care testing of, of some time? And I'm not talking about just urines and Accutex, like an iStat. You got it? Anyone else? No one else with iStats as well? How about troponins and some of these things? Anyone have those? So point of care testing, and I do a whole lecture for ASAP on this topic, and I just have a few papers for you here. You gotta be really careful when you read the point of care testing, because most times it's produced by the person who's making the device for the testing. And they will always tell you that it saves lots of money and saves lots of time. And so there's two things about it. First off, if you go through all of that literature, the amount of money saved is plus and minus. Some of the systems do save money, some of the systems don't. So be careful about this. There are definitely point of care testing systems that cost more money than routine. The next thing is turnaround time. No one really argues with the fact that most of the point of care testings will give you a turnaround time of 10 to 15 minutes versus 45 minutes to an hour for your lab. The question is how often do you encounter a laboratory that you needed to respond to faster than that? And so that's the argument that's out there. The fact of the matter is, is it's probably quite rare. Now, I think we need point of care testing for hemoglobins. Great. I think I need them for an AccuCheck. Great. We all do. I think I certainly need them for a urine dipstick. There's no test I'm more in favor of than the urine dipstick. And we need them for pregnancy testing. Whether you need them really for iStats, what's your experience with your iStats, both of you? So you get, the, you get the immediate gratification. So one of the criticisms of us, and I think it's a fair one, is we are gluttons for immediate gratification. No one is more impatient than an emergency physician waiting for a lab. And that's probably true. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is how often does it really change practice in an important way that's harder to measure? Now, for things where you need a repeat test, I think point of care testing really does save time. So if you're at the point where you need a second troponin before you do something or something like that, then it probably makes a big difference. For most patients being worked up, I think the difference is, is relatively uh, modest. Abstract 17 is a chemistry panel, says that there was a change in management in very few patients, but they couldn't find any change in outcome by going to point of care testing. And abstract 18 says they decrease cost here. You can in some patients, you can in the others. There's one other place where point of care testing offers a big advantage, which is in the unit. And the reason it does so in the unit is because blood draw anemia, we talked about these standard labs, is a substantial problem. Blood draw anemia is responsible for about 10% of the packed red cells given in an ICU. You know what it's like. You remember when you were in the ICU, right? There's some boulder up there that can't be moved with all the pry bars known to mankind. The guy's been in the unit for 37 days. He's got no hope of living, but no hope of dying. And they keep drawing blood on him. His hemoglobin drops, drops, drops. Better give him two units of blood. Well, point of care testing uses about one-tenth the blood volume of standard lab testing. And so there is an advantage in that card. All right. The next question, which I think we can dispense with really quickly, is this issue in trauma patients of type and cross and type and screen. Now, when you talk about this with trauma surgeons, they look at you like, what planet are you on? Suggesting that a trauma patient, who of course could be bleeding, never mind the LR, who of course could be bleeding, of course needs a type and cross. Absolutely. Well, actually, no. Um, it is true that trauma patients can bleed, but the, but the bigger truth on the picture is, is that you usually can tell with relatively simple criteria which patients are most likely to be transfused. And if you use those criteria, it would result in a delay in transfusion for no patients. And you would decrease the number of patients typed in cross by a lot. So when you go to, you know what it's like. If you go to the blood bank in your hospital, the sharpest pencils in the hospital there. In fact, if you listen carefully, you can hear them up there <laughs> using those Boston pencil sharpeners. They have the, they are the most, you know what it's like when you go to give a unit of blood, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign there, sign here, sign here, sign, here, sign. read this with me, read that with me, read this way. I mean, you can get a mortgage easier than you can get a unit of packed red cells. Um, and so these papers point out, if you look at them, like abstract 19, which is by one of our residents from a few years back, Jay Baker, um, looked at this and said, you could tell who was going to need blood. They had a blood pressure less than 90, a pulse greater than 120, a GCS less than 9, or they had an injury where any fool would say they might need blood, like a big hole in their chest. 
And so if you did that, you could change the cross to transfused ratio. So that's a measure of your efficiency. In other words, if you cross a lot of people but transfuse few of them, that number will be high. And in a lot of trauma centers, when they look at their cross to transfuse ratios, the numbers that they're getting, and we did it at our place, the numbers are ranged anywhere between five and eight. That means you're spending a lot of money in the blood bank to type and cross people, pull units out of circulation, and they don't ever get used. Whereas if you typed and screened them instead, that would be better because the units aren't taken out of circulation or type and hold, whatever you call it at your institution, and that would, that would do things much better for you. So abstract um, 20 says that they change just by doing simple clinical things, determining who would get it, they would change their cross to transfuse ratio from 3.8 to 2.8. And that's pretty modest gains. A lot of literature suggests you could do better. Abstract 21 says that the ratio was 4.3 overall, but if you looked at pre-op patients, it was 78, implying there's a lot of unnecessary typing and crossing going on for patients who are going to the OR. And that um, a reasonable goal, if you wanted to look at this for your institution and save time and money, a reasonable goal would be to say, we would like to take our, type to our, our cross to transfuse ratio from around five, which is where most places start, five, six, and get it down to three. And the literature, there's much more, of it, more to it than the ones I provided for you here, but the literature pretty much implies that with good basic clinical criteria, you can go from around five and a half to around three without any patient having delayed transfusion and saving substantial resources at your blood bank and substantial units of blood as well. So I like those papers. I think they're pretty straightforward. And then finally, Abstract 22 is a paper that talks about this whole concept of pre-op labs, which is one of the other things you hear about your trauma patients. This patient is potentially pre-op, so I need a PT, PTT. Have you ever heard Rick do the PT, PTT thing, implying that one's a belt and the other suspenders? You don't put both a belt and suspenders on. You need a belt or suspenders. Um, and so, you know, getting, you know, it's unlikely that, for example, sir, if you had a bloody knee, that you have, you know, late life onset hemophilia A. It just doesn't happen, which is the test for which I'm looking for with the PTT. And so outside of a group where you're looking for undiagnosed hemophilia it's, or DIC, you really don't need a PTT, and that a PTT is one of the most wasted coagulation tests uh, around the or And probably just in the United States, you could save millions of dollars by banning a PTT in a lot of patients. And then lastly, abstract 23 drives right at the heart of this. This paper, by the way, has nothing to do with trauma. So it's, you might look at it and say, what's it doing in here? But it's a great paper that asks the question, are you risk averse or test averse? And it points out that if you're risk averse, you order more and more tests. And if you're test averse, you tend to rely more on clinical things. One of the real pushes in emergency medicine, and I think quite frankly, and I bear some of the blame having been a residency director, is we have created a group of people who are very, very risk averse. And then on top of that, we have the medical legal community and, the, and, the, and our tort system, which creates an even more risk-averse environment. And what we really needed to become was more clinical and more test-averse. And so that's just sort of a philosophical paper at the end of this to ask you to challenge yourself to become, at least in my opinion, we need to, as a specialty, drift in the other direction. The pendulum has swung way too far towards risk aversion and needs to swing back towards test aversion. And we could be a lot more parsimonious and a lot more efficient and order a lot fewer labs. And maybe our trauma system would be able to financially float its boat a little bit better if we squandered less resources on labs that don't change outcomes. So that's kind of the thrust of that. The literature's there. There's probably a lot more papers than this if you wanted to get into the EMMA database on any single specific lab test. But those cover the most readily accessible things to challenge. Thanks.